Hello and welcome to The Found Cause, where we found our cause and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Michael, the man behind the machine, and to my left is... Theodore, in the background. And <laughs> to his left is... Sebastian, the bookkeeper. We are all in studio today for a very special, not really, just a regular old reaction video episode. Um, you can see the apartment getting progressively dirtier and dirtier in our studio. One day, the studio will change the background, but until then, it's just going to keep getting dirtier, so my apologies. Today, we're reacting to a Roman Catholic. Um, recently, actually, in Channel News, one of our debate reviews with uh, between Doug Wilson and James White went uh, viral, and by viral, I mean got like another thousand views, so, uh, you know. Virals, you know, different to every person. It's a big deal. But in honor of that, it was a debate between our Roman Catholics, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, both gentlemen had different opinions on that. Both are anti-Roman Catholic. We in this channel have done many Roman Catholic uh, videos before, and we've done some reaction videos um, to Roman Catholics. But in the spirit of Easter, which just happened, um, I was talking with my wife, and she said she had a friend on Facebook post something about the Shroud of Turin and how amazing it was and how miraculous it was. And uh, if you're not familiar, Shroud of Turin is a relic. Um, supposedly it was the cloth that laid over Jesus when he was buried and then he rose again and it imprinted his delight from his body imprinted a very traditional looking Jesus onto the shroud that is now kept in Turin, Italy. So the question is, um, are relics legit? Is that relic legit? That's another question. That's whatever for those weird ancient alien scientists to discover. Of course, I do not think any relic is legitimate because why would God have um, allowed these things to exist if they're just going to be worshipped? We're going to see the defense of the practice of the veneration of relics from a Roman Catholic perspective, from none other than the leading Catholic apologist channel, Catholic Answers. This is not some fringe person. This is not from some fringe response. Um, we actually watched a couple others to see what the best reaction video for this topic was, and this is the most succinct, best, honestly, most rooted in scripture we could find. So we're going to give him a fair shake and listen to Catholic Answers, Joe Heschmeyer's answer for why do Catholics keep relics? What's the deal with Catholics and relics? If you go into a Catholic church, there's a good chance that they're... I'm just going to pause and say, we should all have like really slow, epic intros like that. I think we thought about it one for this podcast and uh, we never did it. I feel like they're a waste of time, but they do add a certain epicness to all our reaction videos. Sure Somebody's do. bones or a drop of their blood in the altar. And you might even see, particularly in older European churches, the bones of the saints on display with people praying in front of them. I'd like to stop it there and say, yeah, it's creepy that you'd have bones out but it's not that weird i mean we all know graveyards and stuff like that so yeah i mean it is weird to have somebody's skull out just because american culture is not really into death and all the articles of death because dead bodies are considered unclean but um that's not the problem i think we'll all say at the outset that protestants have that me sebastian and theodore have with this whole practice of relics it's not that they are gross icky bones it's that that praying in front of them is more like praying to them or praying in the presence of them or somehow like using them as some magical artifact that channels into God. That is the problem that we have for it because it's um, idolatry, I think, pretty plain and simple. I was going to say, yes, I've experienced this in churches I've been to in Peru, the cathedral in Lima, and also been to churches in Europe. They do display relics. Could be bones or could be, you know, like in France, you had, of course, the crown of thorns, what was laid upon Jesus. So it doesn't have to be bones themselves or body parts in general. Like the Shroud of Turin is just like, a cloth. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I understand. An eloquent priest or bishop might say, yes, I'm not going to worship this thing because I am well read in Catholic theology. I am of sound mind. But when it comes to most regular people, like some humble farmers from the mountains in Peru, they're not well read into Catholic theology. So in practice, it really becomes actual, you crave to go to this item and pray to it in, on, the, on the ground, I would say. So right off the start, we're not, we're not of a good start with Catholics. So we're, that's why we, we don't see eye to eye on this. Well, and he's prefacing the praying in front of it, but why would they be praying in front of it? Yeah. Anyways, let him go. So what's the deal with that? Why do we venerate the bodies of the saints? It's so there we go. So you know, now he's admitting they're not just praying in front of it. Happy, like he's really dressing up the language because, you know, I pray in front of a lot of things and it has nothing to do with them, right? I pray mm -hmm. in front of this lamp and this keyboard and these monitors all the time and it has nothing to do with any of their presence. Um, he admits you're actually venerating the bodies or whatever the items are, bodies of the saints or objects. And what he will fail to do throughout this episode is talk about objects that aren't related to the bodies. He will sort of relate that the, the things once touched a body, so they're related to the body. Mm -hmm. But in any case, these objects are um, being venerated. 
And maybe this, we've talked about this before in the podcast, but before he goes any further, let's talk about that very issue, what the word venerated means. Oh, yeah. I thought of a joke first because that's what I'm here for. Oh, yeah? Um, Our comic relief? <laughs> Go ahead. 50% of Catholics pray in front of statues because the statue casts a shadow on them, which keeps them from burning from the presence of Jesus himself. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Did you really oh, man, the jokes here? <laughs> Making a comedy channel. It got me laughing. Oh, yeah, yeah. George Costanza, get out of here. What were we saying? Oh, yes. Veneration. Yes. What is veneration? Mm -hmm. Yes, you will hear. We have gone over this, lovely audience. Go check out our episodes on Catholicism. We have gone deep into giving examples from the Bible, different words used in Greek and Latin. For worship and veneration two main ones latria dulia in latin latria they say reserved catholics say only reserved for god alone dulia you can you can worship god with that but you can also venerate you can service humans the vener saints. venerate's really just another word for serving supposedly ironically yes. but it's really a stand-in for worshiping because like I serve my earthly masters at my current job, which is a totally regular secular job in advertising. And you could say that's service, but it's definitely not bowing, praying. So they know that there's a difference between regular old service that you do for your neighbor when you like let them borrow sugar or go like repair a fence for them. And when you venerate and bow and pray to and kiss and rub and expect healing from an object. I don't do any of that to my employer. <laughs> Also, Hindus service their gods better <laughs> because they bathe them in milk and honey. Right, right, right. And that's like, yeah, what, what would you call that? Because that's exactly what these sometimes happens with uh, Catholic idols as well. Yes. We have done a whole episode on this, so yeah. don't just take our words on it now. We, can, we have gone over multiple examples from the Old and New Testament in which the words are used interchangeably. They're not different contexts. You can, when you talk about service to God... The natural implication is you're worshiping, you're prostrating yourself in front of God. With that word in mind, prostration, another one used by the Orthodox mostly is proscuneo. Prostrate. Sounds like that. Which is interchangeable with latria. I, dulia. Okay. They interchange it with dulia. So they also have latria, but proscuneo okay. in Greek, in the Orthodox. Yep. Again, the problem is proscuneo is also used for worship and attributed to God. One key example, I'll be short, I'll be brief here. Matthew 4 when the devil is tempting jesus in the desert then jesus said to him be gone satan for it is written you shall worship the lord your god and him only shall you serve in greek kurion ton theon su proskunesis ke afto mono latreusis proskuneo latria you can see those two i understand it's in greek but you can see that both words proskunesis and latreusis use attributed to god alone in mm -hmm. this passage so there really is no distinction and it's really playing with words my humble take on it they're just playing with words when they say yeah we're not worshiping mary we're just attributing service to her yes we may be lighting candles we may be rubbing the statue of mary in church or whatever other saint we're not really worshiping we're not praying to it asking for magical favors but they are <laughs> yes but they are <laughs> right right yes. so uh, i mean again we've gone to more depth of more examples than just that i just feel like that's a particularly powerful example because it's not even just an old testament law from greek or whatever we might try to play word games it's jesus himself responding to the devil quoting deuteronomy in one of the passages from the law saying thou shalt worship no other gods thou shalt serve no other gods right and he uses the words in question in this case proskuneo this prostrating um, because again, all the devil is asking him to do is fall before me and I shall give you these kingdoms that you see before you. And so it doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, you could argue, a Catholic might argue in this case, if it wasn't the devil, and we all know the devil is not good and what the devil is asking, but one could argue that just falling before, falling in the vicinity of Satan wasn't necessarily like worshiping him and making him God, but Jesus and the devil both knew what was at stake here. This falling before him, this proscuneying, this prostrating before him, this dulia and this serving of Satan was a replacement, and at least an addition of Satan mm -hmm. and God to Jesus's pantheon of just one, the Father. So this became um, the same thing as worship. Uh, proscuneo, latria, dulia, they're all the same. They all mean worshiping in a way that only is reserved for God. And so this whole distinction between worship and veneration, there is none. It's a Catholic concept and defense of the fact that they do worship images, icons, and relics. Isn't that superstitious? 
it's superstition is not the problem. Superstition just means going up and above and beyond what the Bible has to say. This is not superstition. It's anti-stition. It's against the religion. The religion says, God's word says, thou shalt have no other gods, thou shalt serve no other gods before me. So it's breaking the first commandment when you do that. Well, the first thing to realize is that scripture gives a great importance to the body. There's sometimes this idea, particularly in the modern world, that I'm just a ghost living in a meat shell, and that death is me being freed from my body. But We're going to stand here and say we also don't like Gnosticism, which is where he's going, uh -huh. um, that we agree that God made the body, made the human body and the spirit at the same time, and he inhabits them purposefully because he makes a man a man by spirit and by body, and that once again we'll be raised again in body. So we agree that bodies are important, but I will tell you, and you can already see where he's going here, and we'll let him finish, but when the Israelites made idols of Yahweh, was it good? Were they combating old ancient, ancient Gnostic heresy about um, things not being physical, but being spiritual? And here they were making physical things because God really reigned and really delivered them from Egypt. So we'll make two golden calves to really physically commemorate his physical um, deliverance of us. No, it was idolatry, which was strictly forbidden by God and is still strictly forbidden. So you, you can justify it to make it sound as godly as you want, but it is explicitly against God's command. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not only the golden calf, when uh, Aaron made that, it's like, oops, kind of made that an idol. Yeah, it's okay. No, not really. But then when the kingdom split, I think right. that's what you're referring to, yeah. right? That he says, these aren't idols. This is God. This is Yahweh. This is the one true God. This calf that I built for you right now, right here, that's the one true and only God. There's no other God in the universe besides this calf right there. Also that one over there. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them. Yes. Again, that was not good. Even though they are attributing to something that's infinitely good, which is the God of the, the creator of the universe. Right. And you can make all the justifications that, oh, the people need a physical image or whatever else the people have been making for literally millennia, but God forbid it. So don't do what God has forbidden. But that's not the biblical or the Jewish or the Christian understanding of the body at all. Back to Gnostics. Yes, we agree. Rather, the idea is that I am both a soul and a body. Agreed. That's why, for instance, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. We read in Exodus 13, verse 19, that Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had solemnly sworn the people of Israel, saying, God will visit you, then you must carry my bones with you from here. What's interesting here, and this is, I think, a separate point than the whole relic stuff, is the importance of bones. I think in that case, Joseph was acting as a prophet, saying that God will deliver you from Egypt, and when you do that as a remembrance of this prophecy, um, carry my bones out. Now, I'll also admit the patriarchs, Joseph, Abraham, Isaac, were kind of pretty particular about where they got buried. And I would make the assertion to say that the reason that burial is sometimes important is so that past generations look at your grave and remember the things about you and the testimonies about you. And in Abraham's case, in Isaac's case, in Jacob's case, and eventually in Joseph's case, this was important for the many generations who would look on them as figures, just like we have like the Lincoln Memorial or the Washington Monument to remember great men who did great things, not just that they were people and like something physical about their nature, but to remember what they did. And a great way of doing that is, is using the body as some sort of signifier. This is, you know, here lay George Washington, here lies Abraham Lincoln, here lies Joseph, son of Jacob. In a way, it's also a sign of nationalism and also affinity yeah. with your eth ethnicity, if you want to call it that, the, mm -hmm. the people of Israel. And rather than being buried in a foreign land, completely separated from your kin, your people, you wanted to be buried alongside your family in Israel, which unfortunately we could have gone to Joseph's tomb, but actually very relevant to today was recently burned by Muslim radicals in, in the Israel-Palestine area, which is truly a shame. So all we can say is, or all I'm saying is, I agree that this is an interesting concept to talk about. I'm personally not against cremation and other forms of burial like the Catholic Catechism is, but I would say that I can see the value in getting buried physically someplace for, like the, for the sake of future generations. But again, that's not the relic situation. The relic situation is like, okay, we're remembering, say, um, the bones of, of St. Anthony or some somebody, right? Somebody, some saint. It's like I said in the very beginning of the episode, we don't really care about the bones or the fact that, that we buried somebody and that we're remembering them. We care about the whole venerating of the saints. So this is not a question of whether you bury somebody or not.
That's also why the Catechism in paragraph 2300 says that burying the dead is a corporal work of mercy. The Catechism puts it like this, the bodies of the dead must be treated with respect and charity in faith and hope of the resurrection. The burial of the dead is a corporal work of mercy. It honors the children of God who are temples of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's really a, a red herring here. I think his point may be that they are present tense temples of the Holy Spirit. Um, but of course, that's just the catechism, not the Bible. Um, I do not believe that the Spirit resides in the bones typically. Of course, the Holy Spirit can reside anywhere he wants. And so there are instances of bones doing things, right? But it's not a guarantee. Our body is passed away. When it passes away, it is no longer where we inhabit. And therefore, the Holy Spirit no longer inhabits the body. Yeah, it's not only really a Catholic uh, trend. I remember seeing someone commenting on some radical charismatics that they were going to graves of past saints right, and then yeah. trying to get the Holy Spirit out of the bones Grave into sucking, them. Grave uh-huh. sucking, So, whoa, it's kind of kind of crazy. As, okay. as if the, the Holy Spirit was lingering around waiting to resurrect the person. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. It's what he does. You know, he's omnipresent. Um, so his manifesting, why would it stay on bones? There's no saint there. It's just his body waiting to be resurrected. We all agree in physical resurrection. It's just... The, the spirit does not promise to lie in any way that's not from the Bible. So you might be thinking, well, that's well and good and all, but what's the deal with taking their bones and their blood? After all, if we need to treat the bodies of the dead with respect, how do we justify chopping them up like that? Well, there are three biblical data points to know here. The first one is... I'd like to point out that he does admit that to get these relics, they often chop up the bodies or whatever else. They take the thumb of St. Peter or they, they bleed them out to get a little vial and they're all cooking <laughs> yes. up all this stuff, um, presumably for profit. You know, skeptical of us would say they're for profit. Uh, most earnest would say they're getting a piece of the person they love so they can have others healed by their heel toe and and beard hair or whatever else they're holding from the saint. But in any case, it's if you went into a funeral home at a Catholic wake and then started pulling teeth out of the guy and like, I want to remember him this way and started pulling teeth and taking his eyeball, um, <laughs> nobody would think you were treating that body with respect like the catechism says you should. So yeah, it is inherently disrespectful to drain blood and take eyeballs and whatever else as memory tokens of a person. Acts chapter five, verses 14 to 15 which says that more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and pallets, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Okay, so this shows us that healing flows, as it were, from the body of Peter. The people flowed from the body of Peter. He did not consistently have the ability to heal. He died, of course, was martyred, as I believe this Catholic would agree to. So he was not always imbued with supernatural power. So God does not always heal the same way. In fact, he usually doesn't. makes it a point to heal in different ways. I'm sure the Catholic would agree, too, that Jesus makes it a point to heal blindness in several different ways. So that it's not to say that mud imbued with spit, like Jesus does one time, is the means of God's healing of blind people. That that was a way he healed, but that's not the way he heals. And in the same way, it's not, it, through the body of Peter was a way that God healed for a time from Peter for that moment at Pentecost and afterwards when the church was multiplying at the foundation of the church, he was healing people, possibly through even the shadow, though we don't know from that text whether or not the shadow was actually healing. It was just the belief of the people. So we don't actually even know if these were faithful believers or if they were just superstitious hearing about the, the healings of Peter. But Regardless, I'll grant you, maybe they actually were being healed by a shadow and they were faithful, but it doesn't actually say that for the record. In any case, it was for a given time period. It's not a a consistent pattern. Yeah. People are going to Peter, laying down in front of him and hoping that they'll be healed just by his shadow passing by. That's so important because if you or I did that today with Pope or some great saint, we can be assured that our Protestant brothers and sisters would decry it as superstitious. But... You know, hard to say that the apostle of Jesus Christ, Peter, compares to a great saint, you know, St. Anthony or Pope Frankie or whoever it might be. But I thought the Mormons were the only ones that said there was a living in apostles around these days. So kind of shocking that the Catholic would also say that there's somebody equivalent to St. Peter, the original pope around today, that um, if was passing by and people were waiting to see his shadow touch them, uh, wouldn't be a disturbing, weird uh, worship. 
Notice that he has hasn't really addressed how do we justify chopping up people. He hasn't done that. He also yeah. hasn't. Obviously, he's not defended the whole veneration thing. Yes. Um, he's defending, I guess, that people were venerating Peter so much that they would want to wait in his shadow. We don't know that that was even a faithful thing that people were doing, by the way. It's just describing how how what mm-hmm. an impact he was making by his healings. Um, and equally, we don't have examples of that happening today from St. Ambrose or whoever else we have relics from. So why would we be venerating people? like that and people were also not worshiping peter they were waiting to get healed by peter so if we were in line to touch the finger of saint ambrose okay but if you're praying in front of it that's clearly i think a violation of the first and second commandment but acts depicts it as what early christian faithfulness looks like not necessarily true okay the second data point to know is acts chapter 19 verses 11 to 12 which says that God did extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were carried away from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Hold your horses. Is that how you justify chopping up dead bodies so we can, like, like handkerchiefs hand them out to people? Well, once again, Paul ends up dying, martyred. So he was not immortal, invincible, whatever. These are all, in the Catholic degree, flowing from God for a time, for a purpose. Um, So it's not the standard. It is a special occasion. That's why it's noted in Acts 19. And so while God can work in this way, it's not his consistent way of working. And once again, the handkerchiefs, whatever, the items that are being brought from Paul or Paul himself touching people and healing people, that is all through God and people give praise to God. It's not a focus on Paul. So while he is the one, he's the guy sharing the gospel. So people take his you know, handkerchief that touched him and go bring it to somebody else. It's the power of God on display, not the power of Paul. And so that tribe. And again, it's still descriptive of what happened it's not prescriptive of right. this is what you should do exactly. so at best they're operating w- from silence or an argument from silence well they're saying that it worked so therefore it must have been blessed from god and therefore it's a perfectly acceptable thing to do these days okay so well yeah and to that i say hold your horses because later in his life when paul is in prison and he's sick he tells i'm, I'm sick he doesn't heal himself. Likewise, when Timothy, one of his best friends, has stomach ache or like some ulcer or whatever it could have been, yeah, he says, drink some wine for your stomach ache. I'm paraphrasing, but... He doesn't well, say, like, my tooth is on the way. I'm sending <laughs> you in the mail or whatever else it might be. So again, not a consistent way of healing. God works and heals however he wants. And while, yes, I'll grant that sometimes bones or handkerchiefs or mud or whatever, God uses many means to heal people, could be used to heal people. It is not an excuse to worship those items plainly. And the handkerchiefs are brought to the dead or whatever, and they're healed or are brought to the sick and they're healed in Paul's case, in this case. Um, do they keep the handkerchief like in a little box and then a ton of people come up to it and start touching it? It's like delivered for a purpose, right? Like Paul or somebody who's going to Paul has a sick family member. Or they get an item from Paul and they're like, okay, this is for the healing of Julia. Then they go to Julia and heal her with the handkerchief. It's not like imbued with 100% magical power. It's just one delivered mission. We have an example of that in the Old Testament too when the, I'm pretty sure it's an Assyrian general asks either Elijah or Eli- Elisha, cure me of leprosy. It's Elisha. Uh-huh. Elisha, and then he is commanded, Naaman, I think is the general, right? Sure. I forget. I forget his don't, name. Don't quote <laughs> me on that, please. I, I'm the bookkeeper, I should know. And then he commands the general to go into He's the river. He's not Assyrian either, it's one of those random other ones, but yes. Okay, Aramean, right. probably Aramean because yeah. he came from Damascus. Okay, Aramean, Aramaic. Go into the river. And then the guy makes a whole fuss about why, why go to this river when I could just stay in my home region and done and done it there. Mm-hmm. Like, just listen to the prophet. I highly doubt that that river was imbued with magical powers right. for the remaining of time. Otherwise, all of us would be there right now getting healed. So it was specifically for what God had appointed Elisha to heal that man at that point in time so that he might bring the, you know, the, the worship of God, I would say, back yep. to his home country. Yep, agreed. That's a point home. And if they started to worship the river, even if it was in like association with Yahweh, it would be the exact same problem as worshiping golden calves. It's worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And when you fall down on your face and worship the bones of St. Ambrose, you are worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Death to that. 
and then you end up like Egypt with 10 or more god well probably more than that gods and then god has to send a plague for every god that you and that's how you get coronavirus you- yes <laughs> <laughs> all right a little bit more direct things that have touched saint paul were getting even more remote than his shadow are being brought to the sick in saint luke who wrote acts it's clear that this is how god did extraordinary miracles by the hands of paul that is God isn't threatened by his saints. God works through his saints and through the bodies of his saints. God is also not threatened by the River Jordan, but like just Sebastian just said, he only uses it to heal Naaman. I think it's the guy, could be a different name, but never. He heals that general, right? One time. These are not um, consistent means of healing. And God, unless you have another example, doesn't work in like items except for like the bronze snake or like really specific items he doesn't work in items detached from a person oh speaking of the bronze snake josiah actually destroyed it because there was some weird cult culty thing developed on the snake it's like yeah these people are worshiping that snake let's burn melt it down wow actually works against them (laughs) highly relevant the reformer king josiah right comes back to reform the nation and yeah they had the bronze snake it had it had previously been used to heal people was not healing anybody anymore right it was a one time command from god look to the snake and be healed and the snake bites right but like sebastian said there was a cult around this relic it was related to god and he needed to destroy it and it was righteous for josiah to destroy it because it was being used for veneration or worship of an idol even though it was in the name of Yahweh, it was something that Yahweh had actually used. Like if he actually had a handkerchief of Paul, you could say this was legitimately used to heal somebody, but it should be destroyed if it's being used for veneration. That is evil. Wow, it's actually on point. I'm glad I remember that. Yeah, it's a pretty much an exact one for one for relics, right? The final verse to know is from the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21, which describes how a man's body was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And it says, mm-hmm. as soon as a man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Well, there we see very explicitly healing, not just through a saint, but through the bones of a saint. In this case, certainly an Old Testament saint. Taken together, these three passages paint a clear picture. Why do we take the bones to as many churches and as many places as we can? Because we believe that God likes to work miracles through his saints. I'll, I'll hedge a bet that Elijah, Elish, Elisha, whatever you call it, the second Elijah, you know, the, the <laughs> protege of Elijah, um, that his bones only healed one guy, right? And it wasn't some like throw, keep throwing him in the pit, keep throwing him in the in the grave with Elijah, just just bones upon bones upon bones in case somebody gets revived by Elisha's bones. It was a one time look, see, truly a prophet of God moment for the people to see, right? Because at the time, you know, on the benefit of retrospective, it's always a question of, was this actually a holy man, right? Was God actually with him, blah, blah, blah. Here's proof that, yes, God's powers clearly um, was with Elisha. Um, Here's his bones reviving somebody. But it is not a precedent to keep throwing people in with Elisha's bones. And it's certainly not some precedent that we should take somebody who's never healed anybody, you know, like St. Ambrose or somebody else, where we have some, you know, dubious things to make him a saint uh, post facto post death and then keeping their bones around and then coming to worship hoping that maybe though it hasn't healed people in thousands of years that maybe today it'll heal somebody that is evil veneration i'll use your words which is worship of these people what adds more to the suspicion of the intentions behind the worship veneration of relics is the fact that for a long time in the middle ages there were fees charged for touching them <laughs> or praying in front of them and also um, buying them and there were also many replicas there were multiple churches and places that called that they own the true foreskin of jesus as a relic mm. other places <laughs> want that <laughs> someone wanted it yes i'm pretty sure or splinters of the true cross that you could make a boat out of it at that point a warship as calvin said there's not enough wood from the cross that would have been able to make a boat, meaning that there's a lot of splinters out there. Too many competitors to actually truly be splinters. Got it. Yes. Explaining joke. Uh-huh. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I, for all the fact checkers, I want to make a correction. This might be important. It wasn't Josiah. It was Hezekiah, another good king oh, of okay. Israel. And, and I'm from Second Kings 18. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. And he broke the pieces of the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan, which means bronze serpent. So they also gave it a name. 
and then he cut it down and then it was a good thing yeah good old shrouded turin kind of deal right mm -hmm. thank you for the correction because yes hezekiah not josiah okay i'm done riffing we'll let him go including those like alicia who have already fallen asleep in death and so we share in the same faith as the early christians like we put ourselves in places where we can encounter the shadow of peter or the handkerchiefs of paul how would you encounter the shadow of peter i guess he's just saying elements from saints First of all, none of these things are elements of actual apostles. We know there's a ton of fakes out there. So all that being said, and the charging of the stuff, uh, it gives incentive for making fakes, right? Because your church becomes famous, or maybe you can be directly profit off the, the relic itself. So there's all these bad incentives to make fake non-real relics. Putting that all aside. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. I was just going to plug, uh, I'm selling some Shadows of Peter on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe pick them up. Bath water he's bathed in. Yeah, yeah. Um, besides all the fakes out there, which I, I would beg to say that every single relic in existence is a fake is not real um, but even if we do have legitimate things that really did touch an apostle or really did um, touch jesus or whatever it is um, they are not like the bone the one-time use bones of alicia they are much more relevant to the bronze snake that hezekiah had to, to break down because people kept going into it for healing when it didn't heal and made it a god an idol um, when it shouldn't have never been what it suggests to me is that when you make offerings for something, especially in pagan times, is that you're hoping to get something in return, meaning yeah. meaning you're not getting it at that time, point in time. But you're hoping that someday, if you bring enough offerings, you'll get something. So if anything, we have precedent from the Bible to do the exact opposite of what Catholic Answers is saying is we should not keep objects, bones or bronze serpents or shrouds or whatever, or, or skin of people or or even the cross of jesus there's precedent to not keep things that even god prescribes that we should use we should get rid of them if there's if they start to be misused right. by people so it's one thing to say we should bury people and treat them with respect and remember our ancestors or saints that gone before us okay but that is a total red herring opposite of the problem here the problem is the veneration the worship all oh, were the bones of the saints if you want to learn more about this topic or others like it visit our website at catholic.com also, visit CatholicAnswerSpeakers.com. Okay, he's just plugging. All right, so there you go. So he did bring up a lot of scripture, no doubt. And he didn't bring up things that sound like Catholic relic worship, right? Where people get thrown into pits. But like we keep saying, I mean, we're broken records. Notice the worship, the veneration part is missing from all of those instances. Nobody venerated the handkerchiefs. Nobody venerated the shadow of Peter. They were venerating the power of God in Peter, but they weren't venerating the shadow, right? So they were healed by means. We don't deny that Jesus, again, healed by means as well, by dirt or word of mouth or touch or the woman that or touched his cloak. Right, exactly. So he heals by physical means all the time. Sometimes not. Sometimes he just says the word and people are healed, but sometimes he doesn't heal by physical means. But in any case, the veneration of those objects is missing from all these biblical examples because that's evil idolatry and so when catholics do it today and point to the fact that god heals people by physical means it's it's an embarrassing defense honestly and if you weren't paying attention you'd think this is a legitimate defense because he does quote scripture and he says this is like what biblical people did and look these people were healed by physical means so when we hope to get healed by physical means today it's not wrong the problem that protestants have with the venerating of the bones of saint anthony or whoever else are not that god doesn't heal today or that god wouldn't heal by physical means or that we shouldn't remember saints or any of that it's that we don't like idolatry and the worship of these objects and that's and the fact that you know i would prescribe that many of them are fake i believe that it's actually the body of saint ambrose all right because you know that's just a guy but it, the actual spear that pierced jesus's side his actual shroud any of his actual um followers bones like i doubt it at least in any case, even if they are real, we shouldn't be venerating them, just like we shouldn't be venerating the bronze snake, which was real, legitimately used by God to heal people um, back in Moses' time, needed to be broken up by Hezekiah. And they actually kept the original one all this time, which actually is kind of shocking. That's a long time to keep that snake around from yeah. rusting and decomposing. All this goes to say, we have said everything, we have laid all the cards on the table. We ask to our Catholic friends to not trust in these physical means it is not these things don't have power these things do not channel the power of god god can use physical means as we've said in most cases he actually doesn't jesus just says to someone get up and walk and the guy whoop, gets up and walk rather trust 
directly the creator of all of these physical objects. Is it, is it great to go to the tomb of St. Ambrose and say what a great guy he was? Go, yeah. go for it. I would do it. We should not pray in front of that. That is frowned upon. That scripture calls us against it. That God himself calls us. Do not do that. Rather, we have to trust in the one who took on human form. The God-man, Jesus Christ himself. He atoned for us once and for all. Yes, in body. And his spirit lived, resurrected again into a physical body, just as we are going to resurrect at the end of time and live forever in his kingdom. But it is only by him and him alone that we can be reconciled to God, have peace and live with him forever in his kingdom. Right. You don't need a mediator and a priest. You don't need a mediator in somebody's bones. You go directly to God, pray and be saved. Do not trust in the works of your hands. You don't trust, trust certainly in the works of others to save you. It's only Jesus Christ that can save you in his work alone. Any last closing thoughts, Theodore? Nope. All right. Well, that is why we have found our cause and that very same Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're the found cause. You get it? <laughs> I've been Michael Lamb behind the machine and to my left has been Theodore in the background. In the background, indeed. You got some Today. jokes in there. Yeah, it's good. But you're like relegated. Poor Theodore and our, our bad th um, studio setup. He's like sitting back here in this couch like our third class citizen. Oh, well. It's I accept my place. <laughs> <laughs> and left of Theodore I'm is... content in all situations. Oh, wow. That's very Christian. <laughs> and left of him is... The bookkeeper. Sebastian. Sebastian. Right. Thanks for listening. And if you want to see the rest of our episodes, you can go to foundcause.poddean.com and download them all for your listening pleasure there. But that is audio only. If you want to see our beautiful faces in the face of our Catholic Answer friend, you can go to youtube.com and search us up there. Or you can go to facebook.com forward slash foundcause. You can also go to iTunes, Spotify, or any other place you might find podcasts and listen to us there until next time when we talk about something completely different i promise you bye bye